Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Hello, and welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's podcast. My name is Kayla Kleist, and I'm an assistant director of the Regulatory Transparency Project here at the Federalist Society. Today, we're delighted to host Eric Dryband for discussion on affirmative action in employment and when it could be legal to discriminate based on protected characteristics in the context of employment. Mr. Dryband, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone who's listening, for taking the time to listen to us today. Absolutely. Uh, For our audience, uh, Eric Dryband is a partner at Jones Day, where he represents clients in investigations, litigation, and counseling in civil rights, employment discrimination, whistleblower, wage and hour, and other matters. Prior to rejoining Jones Day in 2021, Mr. Dryband served as the 18th Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, and he also served as the 12th General Counsel of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC. Mr. Dryman also notably formerly served as a prosecutor in the Office of Independent Counsel, Kenneth Starr. Mr. Dryman has spoken and written extensively about civil rights and other employment laws and has testified about these subjects before committees of the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Now, while there's certainly more to say, in the interest of time, I'll cut my introduction there. Though if you'd like to know more, please feel free to visit regproject.org and read his impressive full bio. With that, however, we can turn to our discussion. Uh, Starting at the beginning, it might be useful to sort of lay the groundwork uh, for this conversation with some definitions. So, uh, in the context of employment, what are voluntary affirmative action plans? Kayla, that's a, that's an excellent question, and I, I just want to preface my remarks by saying that what what I will be talking about will be focused on federal law standards uh, today. Uh, there are, of course, also state and local laws that that uh, institutions, employers, and others need to comply with. But my remarks today will focus on federal law, um, and at the federal level, uh, affirmative action plans. And Kayla, as I understand your question, uh, in employment. Um, are essentially regulated by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that statute uh, permits, generally prohibits race, sex, color, uh, and other forms of discrimination in employment. And the Supreme Court has interpreted Title VII uh, to mean that employers may, on a voluntary basis, implement and act upon uh, affirmative action plans under certain very narrow uh, narrowly tailored circumstances. Um, so that is, affirmative action plans to satisfy the requirements of federal law must be remedial. That is, they must seek to uh, eliminate uh, a manifest imbalance uh, in, in a particular segregated job classification, for example, or to remedy uh, prior discrimination in, in the workplace by that employer. They must be temporary as well. That is, they can't last forever. They should simply be a temporary measure to fix a problem. Um, And they must not, according to the Supreme Court, unnecessarily trammel the rights of those in the majority, such as by requiring uh, their discharge or barring the advancement of, of workers because of their race or sex or color or religion or other protected traits. And so that, at a general level, uh, is what an affirmative action plan is with respect to federal uh, law protections. Got it. Um, So with that sort of framework of remedial and temporary, and also including past discrimination and uh, having, or the the employer needs to demonstrate having a manifest imbalance in their workforce, um, what are the reasons that an employer might implement such a plan? And what would a business need to be aware of when either implementing such a plan or assessing an existing affirmative action plan? Kayla, I think the, in terms of what employers need to be aware of, I think it would help, for example, to describe how this whole doctrine developed. And so let me just start um, with a 1979 Supreme Court case called United Steelworkers of America versus Weber. And in that case, there was an individual named Brian Weber, who was a white employee. Uh, He uh, applied uh, for a job with the defendant employer, and his application was denied. Uh, two successful uh, candidates of a different race, uh, minority candidates, uh, had less seniority than Mr. Weber did, and he claimed that the uh, denial of employment was because of his white race. Um, the case went to the Supreme Court, 
the court considered the fact that the employer um, had a then existing affirmative action plan under a collective bargain agreement with the union that was designed to eliminate racial imbalances in the employer's almost exclusive white workforce. So the, what the plan did was it held 50% of the openings in a training program for African-American employees. The plan was temporary uh, and was only to be in place until the number of African-American employees uh, in the work phase in these particular jobs was commensurate with the percentage of such individuals in the relevant labor market. So it was a temporary plan to remedy this imbalance that existed. We had a, a workforce that, you know, in the 1970s, not long after the Civil Rights Act was passed in the 1960s, was still experiencing significant disparities that correlated with race. And and the court noted that, that in addition to being temporary and designed to attain uh, more of a balance in the workforce, that the plan did not, according to the court, did not require the discharge of any white workers or their replacement with new African-American hires uh, was temporary and the preferential treatment would end uh, promptly as, as soon as there was more of a balance in the workforce and that there did not create any kind of absolute bar to the advancement of the majority employees. So that's an example in which the Supreme Court has essentially affirmed a voluntary affirmative action plan. Now, here we are in 2023, uh, you know, 44 years later or thereabouts. And I think in terms of what employers need to think about today uh, is, number one, what what is the demographic makeup of their workforce? You know, are there imbalances that correlate with race or gender? Uh, and if they do, is there something, some barrier uh, that's creating that kind of imbalance. Uh, there, there certainly uh, is no uh, reason to implement quotas or racial balancing or gender balancing or anything like that. But if there is a significant underrepresentation, for example, of women in certain jobs, uh, there may be neutral barriers that are creating that, that kind of um, underrepresentation, uh, or there might be discrimination happening. But either way, uh, before an employer decides consciously and explicitly to consider protected traits, uh, the employer should assess um, the employer's workforce, particular job categories, uh, to determine whether or not there is this, what the Supreme Court has called manifest imbalance in particular job categories. And then if there is, try to identify reasons for that uh, and those, and then a solution to that problem. Um, so, but those are the standards that I think both the courts and the federal government through the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission anticipate that, um, that employers will, will consider and assess before they, uh, any employer would implement uh, a voluntary affirmative action plan. And I should add, these plans are not required uh, by private employers, that is, other than government contractors, um, but they're voluntary. And so the, the idea is that employers should have some leeway uh, to to make sure that their workplaces are free from any kind of unlawful race or sex discrimination or other forms of discrimination. And if they identify a problem, they should have some latitude to try to fix the problem on a temporary basis and eliminate the problem from the workforce. Got it. Thank you. And thank you for the introduction to sort of the precedent of the court. I look forward to getting into that and the way the EEOC has handled this a little later in the podcast. For now, I'd love to follow up on two of the terms you raised, uh, past discrimination and manifest imbalance. Um, on past discrimination, First off, are both required for a voluntary affirmative action program to be legal under Title VII? No, no. So, um, an employer. So, let me back. If an employer identifies workplace discrimination that's actually happening, or has happened recently, to create the kind of workforce that has some kind of significant disparity uh, in a particular job category. Uh, the employer should try to remedy the problem, eliminate the discrimination. The manifest imbalance idea is something that the Supreme Court created uh, in, in both the Weber case and the case uh, 1987, uh, the case known as the Johnson case. But the gist of that is that the employer does not have to admit or acknowledge that it or its managers or other people in the workplace have been engaged in discrimination or the discrimination has happened in the workforce but it's one or the other, Kayla. So if, for example, the employer says, well, we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't want to admit that we've engaged in discrimination and open ourselves up to a lawsuit, uh, 
but we do recognize that we have in a in a particular job category a significant underrepresentation, let's say, of African American workers or women or some category of workers that correlates with some protected trait like race, color, national origin, or religion, for example, or gender, sex, that the employer then can can act to uh, eliminate that imbalance in the workforce without admitting uh, to past discrimination. I mean, it could be that that both existed, that is, past discrimination created the imbalance, but the, it's not necessary that both exist for an employer to act upon uh, a voluntary affirmative action plan so long as the employer is acting in good faith within the, the parameters established by the Supreme Court and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Got it. Okay. So if, if a, in a, uh, a business does decide to say we are doing this because of past discrimination, um, they don't necessarily need a manifest imbalance. If it's just the past discrimination uh, criteria, what would the criteria for uh, establishing that exists be? And what is the timeline on that? Uh, I.e., how past is past? Recent past. <laughs> so in other words, the, it, it would not be sufficient for an employer to say, okay, uh, 45 years ago or 50 years ago, our company engaged in discrimination in a particular job category. We don't have a current problem uh, and we haven't had a problem for a long time, but we're just going to implement some race or sex conscious affirmative action plan. Uh, the, the, the point of the past discrimination standard for Title VII affirmative action plans is the idea that the past discrimination has caused a problem that exists right now that the employer is trying to fix or remedy. Uh, so if, for example, uh, again, this came up in the 1970s when um, the labor market and the country were much closer to the pre-civil rights era uh, practices in our country. Uh, that's when the standard about past discrimination came up. Uh, but the idea is that if an employer identifies in some portion of its, of its company, some particular job category, uh, some kind of former or even recent discrimination that is currently causing a problem. Um, and usually these are linked in the sense of the past discrimination caused this imbalance in the workforce, uh, that the employer then to fix the problem, to eliminate or remedy this past discrimination can for a limited period of time under certain narrow circumstances uh, take account of criteria protected traits like race or sex or other protected traits to essentially correct the problem, eliminate the past discrimination, eliminate this manifest imbalance, and then just move on uh, and provide equal employment opportunity to people. Got it. And on the, the flip side, then, if a, an employer goes, we well, no, we're just doing the manifest imbalance route, we have a manifest imbalance, and that's why we're implementing this voluntary affirmative action plan. Uh, how do they demonstrate they have such an imbalance in their workforce? There are different ways to do that, Kayla. The, the, the best way typically is to understand the demographic makeup of the particular job or job categories that the employer is considering implementing a plan um, to have a sense of, you know, is there some kind of statistically significant or other significant underrepresentation of, of workers because or in, it correlates with their race or their sex or their some other protected trait color, for example. Uh, and then if they, if they do identify that kind of problem, uh, then, then they, they, should, they can do different things. There's no particular required approach. One option would be to identify neutral barriers that may be limiting employment opportunities that creates this imbalance. That is usually the least controversial approach. If there's some neutral criteria that's not necessary to the job, uh, th that the company might consider changing or eliminating that might solve the problem. If there's not, uh, then, then of course, the Supreme Court has recognized uh, the employer may implement a temporary, narrowly tailored uh, affirmative action program to try to correct this imbalance, this underrepresentation of, say, women or uh, minorities or whoever is underrepresented, and then uh, to do it for a time-limited uh, period and to try to attain a more balanced workforce, and then to end the end the end the practice uh, when the, the solution when it reaches a uh, more of a balanced workforce. Um, I should add too that uh, the, the court has 
certainly indicated, the Supreme Court has indicated that employers may not in perpetuity or eternally uh, create some kind of racial quota system or racial or gender balance uh, without regard to um, this underrepresentation or, quote, manifest imbalance, as the court has called it. Got it. That actually uh, ties into the next question I had on this, which was, uh, what is the difference between attaining a balanced workforce um, and then maintaining a balanced workforce, which I, I think you've said is it needs to sunset at some point. Um, it, it can't be sort of a cyclical process where you sort of drift in, in you get balanced and you drift out, you're imbalanced and you come back and forth. It sort of needs to sunset at some point. Yes. So, Kayla, yeah. So the, this, the federal civil rights laws protect all people against race, sex and other forms of discrimination. And so the Supreme Court has explained um, that, for example, men are protected against sex discrimination, as are women. And in, a, in a, an opinion by uh, then Justice Thurgood Marshall, that white individuals are protected against race discrimination on the same standards as everybody else. So the the the. the the default position is that the protected traits of race, sex, color, religion, national origin, and there are others too, age, disability, and so forth, that these protected traits protect all people. And that there isn't some kind of favored category where the standards are different for people, but rather they protect all people in the same way. And so the, the idea of the voluntary affirmative action plan is that it is a very narrow exception to the anti-discrimination protections that apply generally in employment. And it's a narrow exception primarily designed to permit employers to have some flexibility to eliminate uh, discrimination, to eliminate barriers to employment that might be causing either actual discrimination or might have the effect of adversely impacting uh, some group of people because of a protected trait, and that this is to be done on a temporary basis to try to eliminate the problem, kind of iron out what, what's been causing this imbalance in the workforce. And then once that happens, according to the Supreme Court, the idea is then, then, it, then it's over with and done. And then we go back to the essentially colorblind, genderblind uh, practices that protect uh, everyone in the workforce against unlawful race, sex, and other forms of discrimination. And so the idea is that employers may not maintain a kind of racial or gender preference scheme indefinitely, nor may they maintain or essentially uh, create a quota system that would ha have defined percentages of people based on race, sex, and other protected traits just in perpetuity. The point is there is a narrow exception for um, for, for the use of these protected traits that is a, is, a, is a deviation from the normal practice that everyone is protected because of, of the, their race, against discrimination because of their race, sex, and so forth. And the, and the idea is to eliminate the problem and then, get, and then implement protections for everyone. That's the idea behind what the Supreme Court has instructed on this issue. Got it. And that actually uh, pivots perfectly in sort of this next set of questions I had, which was how the, cause this is obviously a law um, that is being interpreted both by agencies, particularly the EEOC and then the courts. Um, and so I, I was wondering how have the EEOC and the courts outlined the principles of Title VII and how it applies to affirmative action plans in the context of employment through the years? And has that construction changed over time? Okay. So yeah, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission enforces Title VII and other federal anti-discrimination laws, as does the U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Labor. But I'll just focus for a moment on the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So the commission in 1979 issued regulations about employer affirmative action plans, but those regulations issued about five or six months or thereabouts before the Supreme Court decision issued in the Weber case that I mentioned earlier. Once the Weber case came down, most employers looked to the standards articulated by the Supreme Court in the Weber case to structure their practices uh, to, with, with respect to these voluntary affirmative action plans. However, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission affirmative action regulations remain on the books, and they do provide an option for employers 
uh, to consider uh, going through a process that will implement a, a, a compliance with those regulations. And they, the, the regulations are in the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, they have there are essentially three steps to these the, the EOC process. The, uh, the first is that that the regulations contemplate a self analysis by an employer to determine whether employment practices do or tend to uh, exclude or disadvantage or restrict or result in adverse impact or disparate treatment uh, of previously excluded uh, or restricted groups or leave uncorrected the effects of prior discrimination. And then if so, as part of this self-analysis to attempt to determine why uh, these practices uh, are happening and what they're, what they're causing. Then if that self-analysis does uh, result in some finding by the employer that there's a problem, um, then the, the move to step two of the EOC regulations, and that is that the employer then may move forward if it has what the EOC believes to be a reasonable belief or reasonable basis for believing that affirmative action is permissible, such as, for example, if the, the, the self-analysis determines that the employer's practices uh, leave the effects of prior discrimination either by the employer or others uncorrected. And if, that, if, if the employer then has a reasonable basis, it then may implement some kind of reasonable affirmative action program uh, to eliminate the problem uh, and to, again, ultimately create a workplace that's free of any kind of discrimination um, and, and then go back to promptly um, the, the race uh, blind and color, colorblind, gender blind practices that the Civil Rights Act contemplates. Um, I should add one benefit of the EEOC regulations is that if an employer relies upon them and acts upon them, the employer is absolutely protected from any liability under Title VII for complying with those regulations, even if the courts determine that the EEOC regulations are invalid. Having said that, the, the standards between the Supreme Court in the Weber case and the subsequent case in the Johnson case are very similar. They're, they're, they're largely similar, and compliance with one let me clarify, compliance with the EOC regulations will usually almost always result in compliance with the standards that the Supreme Court has announced. And so it's an option available to employers who want to do this. I should add, Kayla, there was a 2009 decision, the most, the most recent pronouncement by the Supreme Court on this issue, that did take a different approach. Um, it did not mention voluntary affirmative action, but it, there was a case called Ritchie versus De Stefano. And in that case, the court considered a claim by white and Latino workers that they were passed over unlawfully for promotion uh, by the employer, uh, their employer, the city of New Haven, Connecticut. Um, when they took a test, they did well in test, and the employer threw out the results of the test to deny them employment. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs. And in that case, the court articulated a slightly different standard uh, for any kind of race-based action the court said that Title VII prohibits that kind of race-based action by an employer unless the employer can demonstrate a strong basis in evidence that had it not taken the action, it would have been liable under Title VII's disparate impact statute. Now, this kind of approach does not typically or, or at all really apply to voluntary and affirmative action plans, it, but it applies to when an employer discriminates to modify the outcome of say a personnel process, a promotion process or hiring process where the employer decides it simply doesn't like the results of the process it's set up and and therefore by explicitly uh, considering protected traits like like race, Lucia and Richie. The, the, that standard is very, very difficult for an employer to satisfy and it normally, it doesn't apply outside, in my view, uh, outside the affirmative action context. I mean, it applies only to the modification of of outcomes of practices, but not to affirmative action practices. The, the Weber model and the EEOC regulations that I mentioned govern uh, employer affirmative action programs. Got it. I will follow up on the court's precedent in just a little bit, but I realize I, in asking about definitions, I failed to ask about uh, disparate impact under Title VII. So, uh, Backing up just slightly, what are Title VII's disparate impact provisions, and what would one need to prove to show that there is a disparate impact of whatever on a protected class? Yeah. So, th th another excellent question, Kayla. Thank you. So, uh, the Supreme Court recognized um, 
this concept of disparate impact discrimination in a 1971 case called Griggs versus Duke Power. And the idea was that there are certain facially neutral practices that adversely impact workers because of their race or their sex or some other protected trait. That's the idea. The concern is that too much of a focus on disparate impact creates a quota-based system or incentives for quota-based conduct. So in 1991, Congress amended Title VII, the Civil Rights Act, uh, to, um, to implement statutory provisions about the proof structure for disparate impact uh, liability under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. And essentially, the, the standards in the statute create a three-part kind of proof structure. The first is that the plaintiff must identify some facially neutral practice, like a test or some neutral standard, that has a significant disparate effect on a protected group. If if, if, if some neutral practice does um, have this kind of significant disparate impact on a protected group because of race or sex or other protected traits, we move to step two. The employer then simply must demonstrate um, that the practice uh, that has the adverse impact or is causing an adverse impact is what's called job-related and consistent with business necessity. So, for example, let's take my job. I, I'm, I work as an attorney. I practice law. I'm required to be a member of the bar and have my law license. The, uh, having a law license could be looked at as a neutral practice, but it's also practice that's related to my job and consistent with the necessary performance of my work. Because if I don't have a law license, I can't, I can't practice law. <laughs> so, so if an employer had a standard like that, it could, it could be lawful if it causes a disparate impact, if it's job related and consistent with business necessity. That's step two, this business necessity standard related to the job, et cetera. And the idea there is that employers should not be permitted to have neutral practices that are unrelated to the job that adversely impact individuals because of their race or their sex or other protected traits. But, but if the employer then demonstrates that the, the practice is job-related and consistent with business necessity, the plaintiff may still win if the plaintiff um, can demonstrate that there is an alternative practice that would be equally effective uh, in predicting, for example, job performance or things of that nature, uh, would, not as, would not have the same kind of adverse impact on the protected group, and the employer refused to adopt that alternative practice. So, but that's essentially, Kayla, the, the proof structure around disparate impact. And um, you know, these are difficult cases uh, on many levels, but the, the standards are statutory now, and they've been refined in the courts uh, in the in over several decades of litigation. Got it. So, with definitions established, then I'd love to circle back to the courts. Um, obviously, we're recording this in July of 2023. So, the Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard and Students for Fair Admissions versus North Carolina Chapel Hill were both recently decided. Um, so, affirmative action is in the news and at the top of mind, um, and particularly how affirmative action is being treated by the courts. Uh, you've mentioned a couple cases. Um, but I'd love to know what is controlling precedent in the arena of affirmative action in the context of employment at this point in time? Um, the, in, in the employment area, uh, with respect to federal law, the controlling cases are the Weber case that I mentioned and a case called Johnson versus Transportation Agency of Santa Clara, California. Uh, the Johnson case was decided in 1987. The Weber case that I mentioned in 1979. Uh, those cases, in my view, continue to control uh, with respect to Title VII affirmative action plans and, and employment. Uh, and there was nothing, in my view, in the Supreme Court's decision in the Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard College case uh, that contradicts those cases. Uh, the court, uh, in the majority opinion in the Students for Fair Admissions case, did not cite either Weber or Johnson. The court did say that um, that institutions under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment uh, may consider uh, traits like race very narrowly uh, to remedy specific instances of discrimination or to deal with issues of like human safety. And it gave an example of a prison riot, for example. Um, and I think those standards um, are largely consistent with what the Supreme Court said in the Weber and Johnson cases about Title VII affirmative action plans. 
Um, I should add that uh, Justice Gorsuch wrote a concurring opinion joined by Justice Clarence Thomas in the Students for Fair Admissions uh, case in which he explained that Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which was the statute at issue uh, in the Harvard case, in addition to the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the Title VI, its plain language, um, prohibits all the race discrimination, and it's very similar to the prohibitions contained in Title VII. Uh, and so Justice Gorsuch seems to be of the view that the, the statutes are plain and they prohibit all discrimination with respect to race, which is what he was considering in that case. Um, but he did not consider, and his opinion did not cite, either the Weber or Johnson cases, nor did his uh, opinion say anything about how Title VII uh, has been used to remedy prior discrimination or to deal with what Supreme Court in the Weber and Johnson cases referred to as this manifest imbalance in the workplace. So my view is that the controlling precedent under Title VII with respect to employer affirmative action plans uh, survives uh, at, intact, the Supreme Court's decision in Students for Fair Admissions. Uh, and that, that I should add to Kayla, I think that what was at issue in the Harvard case was something very different in the sense that the Supreme Court was considered considering the use of race in a non-remedial sense for diversity purposes. The Supreme Court has never extended that rationale to employment this diversity rationale, and all of the courts have looked at it have said that it does not apply to Title VII. That predates the decision in Students for Fair Admissions, and I think the court's, the majority opinion is consistent with what, what both prior Supreme Court precedent on that issue and what other courts have said about it as well. Got it. So on that non-remedial issue, I recognize it, it's a little bit of one type of apple to another type of apple because we're talking about affirmative action in the context of higher education and admissions versus affirmative action in the context of employment. So there's similarities, but they aren't the same. Um, but it, you mentioned non-remedial affirmative action plans and the way they've been treated in higher education. And obviously, uh, Students for Fair Admissions, both of those cases addressed that issue. Um are those types of plans legal in the context of employment policy? Do we have a decision either from the EEOC or from the courts on whether or not an employer could do a non-remedial affirmative action plan? Okay, let me talk first about what, it, what I mean by a non-remedial affirmative action or diversity program. So um, the, the Supreme Court in the Weber and Johnson cases and the Equal Employment Opportunity Regulations contemplate contemplated voluntary affirmative action employment to correct a problem. That is, as I mentioned, either this prior discrimination by the employer or some kind of practice or problem that's created an unbalanced or imbalanced workforce. In the Harvard case that the Supreme Court decided, they were considering what, I, what I'll call a non-remedial, to use the term you mentioned, Kayla, a non-remedial affirmative action or diversity program. And that's a program that simply uses uh, a protected trait, in this case, race, um, not to remedy any prior discrimination, not to eliminate any kind of imbalance in a, in a segregated job, for example, but instead simply pr promotes diversity for diversity's sake. Um, that rationale has never been extended to the employment setting by any federal court at all. And it's been rejected by every court that's looked at. Um, it likewise is, is inconsistent with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission standards in their regulations. And it is also inconsistent with regulations that govern government contractor affirmative action plans. So what the court was dealing with, I think, in Students for Fair Admissions was something different than either the courts or the U.S. Department of Labor or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission have sanctioned an employment. So in, in my view, the issues were different. And that's why I, I think that the, the standards that continue to govern uh, employer affirmative action plans, in, in my judgment, survive intact and are consistent with what the Supreme Court said in the Students for Fair Admissions case. Got it. Okay. Th that's really useful in sort of understanding how this case that does affect affirmative action but isn't in the employment context could then have ramifications it for uh, affirmative action plans uh, in the employment context. Um, I think I just have a, a last question sort of to, or a last 
couple questions to round out the discussion, um, barring any final thoughts. We've covered sort of what the premises are and what the EEOC has said, as well as what the courts have said. Um, do we have a clear test currently for what is required for a race or sex conscious remedial affirmative action plan, since we know that non-remedial doesn't work, uh, to be permissible in the employment context under Title VII? We have, we have legal standards that govern um, but the application of those standards can sometimes be difficult. Uh, the, there are many types of, let's call it race conscious or gender conscious practices that I think would fall outside of the standards. For example, let's imagine that an employer simply wants to expand its recruiting. And so an employer decides it's going to recruit at, at some women's colleges and at historically black colleges and universities. That wouldn't be necessarily an affirmative action plan. It was simply expanding where the employer is recruiting from. And so long as the decisions are made uh, on a race neutral or sex neutral basis would not implicate any kind of affirmative action standard. But so the standards, I think, are clear um, in terms of what at the federal level, govern employers. Those are the standards that are that are articulated in the Supreme Court's decisions in the Weber and Johnson case in, that I mentioned earlier. There are standards similar and analogous standards in regulations issued by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and then for government contractors in employment, regulations issued by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. And so, employers can look to uh, all three of those categories of uh, authority, that is the federal courts, uh, the e Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the U.S. Department of Labor uh, at the federal level, and then um, and then structure its programs around compliance with those standards. Got it. And truly, last question, uh, what are the risks in, in sort of looking at those factors that risk your excuse me, what are the risks that employers, there we go, uh, who implement such plans should be aware of or uh, vice versa? If an employer goes, I, I don't want to implement one, uh, what are the risks um, from a Title VII standpoint to a business who it doesn't have an affirmative action program? There are dueling risks, I think, that employers face. So on the one hand, as I mentioned, I, 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 did not, I, I believe that the Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard College decision did not change the standards that govern employer affirmative action programs. However, that decision certainly raised uh, awareness of the lawful and unlawful use of traits like race. Um, and I anticipate be there, because of this heightened awareness that we're likely to see much more in the way of legal challenges to employer diversity and affirmative action programs going forward. Um, so I think there is risk in terms of employers, um, on the one hand, with, may face challenges to whatever they are doing to implement, say, a voluntary affirmative action uh, program in their workplace. On the other hand, if an employer um, has a significant underrepresentation uh, in a particular job category and multiple job categories of uh, individuals because of race or because of sex or other protected traits, they face potential individual and even potentially class action lawsuits on the other side where the claim would be that a significant underrepresentation of, of, of workers uh, because of race or sex or some other trait is evidence of systemic race or sex discrimination against the individuals who are significantly underrepresented. So there are risks on both sides. And I think the, the best way to address that risk is to understand what the employer's practices are, what impact uh, on workers, on hiring, on pay and promotions and other employment practices uh, are having in the workplace, what, what, the, the, what kind of workforce the employer actually employs. It, are there underrepresentations? Are there barriers to advancement, to hiring, to employment that, that the employer might eliminate, that would eliminate problems that might be happening or might creating limited opportunities for people that correlate with their race or sex or other traits? Uh, but there is risk, on, I think, uh, in both directions, Kayla for employers. 
Got it. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, barring any final thoughts, we can wrap it there. Uh, Mr. Dryman, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and sharing your expertise and your insight. Uh, we really appreciate it. This has been an incredibly helpful explainer of this pertinent and timely issue. Uh, and thank you to our listeners for taking the time. On behalf of the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch Podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 